This is VOA News via remote. I'm Tommy McNeil. At a news conference, the State Department spokesman Ed Price says U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska in Washington Monday. He added that the United States is supporting Ukraine's investigations of alleged war crimes by Russia. We are leaning forward uh, in terms of the information that we are sharing uh, with our Ukrainian partners to help them build uh, the case for accountability against those uh, who may have perpetrated war crimes and other uh, atrocities. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told employees at the U.S. Department of National Intelligence uh, that uh, it was uh, U.S. intelligence that was key to building the support for Ukraine ahead of uh, Russia's invasion earlier this year. In his remarks, Blinken says U.S. intelligence is vital to aiding the nation's diplomatic efforts. Moving forward, if we continue to hold ourselves to the highest standards of accuracy, credibility, transparency, I think we can leverage intelligence in new ways to support our diplomacy. That's what we've learned from this. There is a profound um, synergy between our intelligence and our diplomacy that we've now discovered in, in new ways and that I think we really need to continue to make part of our thinking. All of this comes as Russia kept up its relentless shelling across Ukraine. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is expanding the shakeup of his security services by suspending 28 more officials. On Sunday, he dismissed two senior officials over allegations that their agencies contained collaborators and traitors. In his nightly video address on Monday evening, Zelensky said a personnel audit of the security service was underway and the dismissal of the 28 officials was being decided. This is BOE News. The White House is touting a month of declining gas prices. We get more details from AP correspondent Lisa Dwyer. White House is touting a 34-day drop in gas prices nationwide, calling it one of the fastest declines in fuel prices in a decade. At a White House press briefing, White House economic advisor Jared Bernstein had this to say. Probably the toughest constraint uh, facing uh, American households right now, uh, the, uh, the budgetary impacts of these elevated prices, and uh, we're showing you here today uh, some real results. Asked if the administration is preparing for a recession, Bernstein said, Based on consumer spending, based on payroll employment, based on where the unemployment rate is, I think we can confidently say that these, these numbers that we're posting are very much inconsistent with a recessionary call given where we are right now. Bernstein says that around 20,000 gas stations across over 30 states are now charging less than $4 per gallon. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Officials from 40 countries are meeting in Berlin to discuss how to stay focused on fighting climate change while the world reels from the economic fallout of the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The U.N. Secretary General Monday admonished countries to take action instead of playing a blame game. European nations vowed to fulfill their climate targets, even as the war in Ukraine prompts some to seek new fossil fuel sources and turn at least temporarily to coal to make up for shortfalls in Russian energy deliveries. But those energy shifts are viewed with suspicion by developing countries. South Africa's environment minister says we cannot have backtracking on coal by rich nations. Two former White House aides are expected to testify at the House January 6th committee's hearing Thursday as the panel examines what Donald Trump was doing as his supporters broke into the Capitol. That's according to a person familiar with the plans. Matthew Pottinger and Sarah Matthews are expected to testify according to the person who was not authorized to publicly discuss the matter. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, says he plans to retire by the end of President Joe Biden's term in January 2025. Fauci, who was 81, became director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in 1984 and has advised seven presidents. Fauci said on CNN Monday that he does not have a specific retirement date in mind and has not started that process. He was thrust into the national spotlight at the height of the coronavirus pandemic under then-President Donald Trump, who suggests the pandemic would fade away, promoted unproven treatment methods, and vilified scientists who countered him. Recapping our top story at a news conference, the U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price says U.S. President, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, met with Ukraine's First Lady in Washington, adding that the United States is supporting Ukraine's investigations of alleged war crimes by Russia. Via remote, I'm Tommy McNeil, VOA News.
Today is Tuesday, July 19th, and this is VOA's International Edition. I am Chinedo for in Washington. Coming up in the next half hour, European Union foreign ministers approve 500 million euros of new funding to supply arms to Ukraine. The war will continue, will continue supporting, and that's why I have proposed the next tranche of the European Peace Facility allocating 500 million more. Turkish president moves to overcome Iranian and Russian objections to its military operations in Syria. A Turkish military operation against Kurdish militants in Syria is expected to top President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's agenda when he meets with his Iranian and Russian counterparts in Tehran. And 36 passengers survive a fiery plane crash in Somalia. We'll have these stories and more next on International Edition. Stay tuned. European Union foreign ministers agreed on Monday to another 500 million euros of funding to supply arms to Ukraine. The move makes the bloc's security support to 2.5 billion euros since Russian forces swept into the country on February 24th. The money should help the EU provide more equipment and supplies for Ukraine, including lethal weaponry that the bloc says should be used for defensive purposes. The EU approved the first tranche of the aid just after Russia's invasion began in what was described by EU officials as a watershed moment for a bloc long wary of military involvement beyond its borders. EU Foreign Policy Chief Josep Borrell. Russia continues launching missiles targeting civilians in war. In particular, once again, raising prices on. We are terrified by the violence of the Russia aggression against civilian people in Ukraine. And there are also disturbing reports about the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war by the Russian troops. Russia continues to target fields and foodstocks. Everybody has seen the images of wheat fields being burned. They continue blocking the exports from Ukraine. They are responsible for the hunger in the world. The war will continue, will continue supporting, and that's why I have proposed the next tranche of the European Peace Facility allocating 500 million more. It has been a political agreement on supporting this proposal. The decision will be taken on the next days, but today the ministers agreed on that. That's EU Foreign Policy Chief Josep Borrell. Russian President Vladimir Putin said on Monday it would be impossible to cut Russia off from the rest of the world and that the country must focus on developing its own technology and supporting fast-growing companies. Quote, clearly we cannot develop in isolation from the rest of the world, and it won't be like that. In today's world, you cannot just circle everything with a compass and put a huge fence around yourself. It's not just possible, unquote. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan wants to overcome Iranian and Russian objections to Turkey's military operation in Syria at a Tehran summit Tuesday. The meeting also comes as Erdogan seeks to finalize a deal to export trapped Ukrainian grain. For VOA, Dorian Jones reports from Istanbul. A Turkish military operation against Kurdish militants in Syria is expected to top President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's agenda when he meets with his Iranian and Russian counterparts in Tehran Tuesday. The Turkish military is building up its forces to strike against Syrian Kurdish fighters of the YPG group, which Ankara claims are linked to Kurdish insurgents fighting Turkey. Attila Yeshalada is an analyst with Global Source Partners. Iran has been fairly outspoken in terms of objecting to Turkey's impending Syrian military campaign, perhaps he might go there sorted out. With Turkish forces controlling a large swathe of Syria along Turkey's border, Tehran is wary of Ankara's expanding influence in a country it considers a close ally. Erdogan's efforts to overcome Iranian opposition are complicated by his rapprochement efforts with Israel and Saudi Arabia, both rivals of Iran. Iran and Turkey have a long history of managing rivalries, but analysts see the fact that Erdogan is visiting Tehran as a sign that a deal can be made. Aydin Seljan is a former Turkish diplomat. They will not both invite Erdogan to Tehran and then insult him by saying that if you are going to have good relations with Saudis and Israelis, then you will not welcome here. I don't think that would be the case. With Russian forces controlling Syrian airspace, Erdogan also needs Putin's cooperation. 
The two leaders are expected to discuss efforts to secure a deal to export trapped Ukrainian grain to world markets. Zal Gazimov is a professor of history at Bonn University. In grain to world markets. These aspects of Ukraine with exports and Syria are very closely interwoven with each other. They always were, and the negotiations will show whether the actors, Turkey and Russia, are able to bargain over the entire geography of direction. Turkey recently hosted a four-way meeting with Russia, Ukraine and the United Nations, where officials said they made progress to release grain trapped at Ukrainian ports. Analysts see Erdogan's meeting with Putin as key to continuing the diplomatic momentum to secure a grain deal. They also say the gathering also underlines the Turkish leader's growing diplomatic prowess. Dorian Jones of VOA News, Istanbul. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky fired the head of the country's security services and its prosecutor general on Sunday, citing hundreds of criminal proceedings into treason and collaboration by people within their departments. This as Russia's military pressed its efforts to expand into Ukraine's east. From Kyiv reporter Anna Chenikova speaks with Flashpoint Ukraine's Steve Miller. In particular, the Security Service and Prosecution Office, there were a lot of questions to their operation and to people involved in their operation even before the war. But this story is kind of, you know, permanent in Ukraine. So if you look at Ukrainian politics and of course, there were questions to these people. They were not particularly, you know, announced something huge in terms of investigations or something, but there were questions. And of course, for Ukraine, this announcement that President Zelensky made yesterday it was quite unexpected because, of course, no one knows exactly what's happening inside this big cabinet and what's going on. But we hear time to time that certain representatives of this, of both of these organizations have been either caught on reporting to Russian services or working with Russian services. So there were these reports. And apparently at one point, these reports made President Zelensky to go forward with such reaction. What we know for the moment, how, as President Zelensky stated, that the large amount of crimes against national security and the connections of representatives of the security forces with the special services of Russian Federation pose serious questions to the heads of these two bodies. President Zelensky said that he was saying not once that this should be investigated and should be eliminated as soon as possible, but apparently it was not done. According to representatives of the president's office, the inspections will be conducted based on the results of these inspections. President will decide on the final decision because for the moment the head of prosecutor office and the head of uh, national security they are suspended from their duties so they're not fired for the moment that's reporter Anna Chernikova speaking with flashpoint ukraine steve miller from kiev pressure is mounting on pakistan's prime minister shabazz sharif to hold early elections after a stunning defeat any crucial provincial assembly election by his predecessor Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan's PTI party won 15 of 20 seats up for grabs in Punjab, bidding their arch rivals, the PMLN, on their home ground, weakening the coalition government. Khan, who was ousted by a parliamentary vote, has called for early polls as the country reels from inflation, energy shortages, security challenges, and political tensions. For more, I spoke with VOA's Ayaz Gal. The outcome of this result was totally unexpected. It has surprised everybody because traditionally in Pakistan, whenever a prime minister leaves the office, whether ousted because of some political opposition alliances or any other way, that prime minister, when goes back, his constituencies or her constituencies, they are never, never welcomed. But what we have seen over the last four months that ever since Imran Khan has been removed from the office of the prime minister, this man has been able to hold massive rallies. And these rallies he held across Pakistan. And every time the rally is much bigger in size. And that was quite unusual for people in Pakistan to really try to gauge the reasons. But it seems that Imran Khan was able to sell this narrative of so-called U.S.-led conspiracy and opposition conspiring with the United States to get rid of his government, that he has been able to sell this narrative to the voters because everybody believed until yesterday morning before the voting began 
that the ruling party of Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif was going to secure at least half of the 20 seats uh, that were up for grab in the provincial assembly. But to the surprise of everybody, political parties, analysts, Imran Khan's party has secured 15 seats out of 20. And in fact, right now there is one controversial result on one of the seats and Imran Khan's party has gone to the court. And if the recounting is done, there are pretty much good chances for Imran Khan's party to even secure that 16th seat. Well, that means his party is now in a position again to reclaim power. Washington has denied interfering and influencing the removal of uh, Mr. Khan. How is the ruling party spinning this? What has been their reaction to this? What analysts say is a devastating upset? The ruling party has also rejected these allegations by Imran Khan as ridiculous that they were working with some foreign country. And they are basically arguing that it was within the parliament that they tabled a no-confidence vote against Imran Khan and they were able to form the new government through a constitutional province. So as far as their narrative is concerned, yes, they are defending their government. They are saying that they are here to fix the problems that Imran Khan's government created for the country, especially not fixing deeply rooted economic problems. But the challenge for them is that this is very unusual for Pakistani politics, that a deposed and ousted prime minister has been able to mobilize this massive crowd over the last few months. And this is a totally new phenomenon for this country. And in any democracy, it's the public support that matters. So whatever Imran Khan has been saying, it appears or it seems from the outcome after like more than three months, that people are buying it, people are with Imran Khan. This has never happened in the history of Pakistani politics that when there is a by-election in a province, that usually the turnout is very low because people have not that kind of interest that they show in general elections in the country. But the turnout was amazingly almost 50%. That's VOA Zayas Gao speaking with me from Islamabad. Somali authorities say an aircraft carrying 36 passengers and crew crashed at Mogadishu's airport Monday, but all on board survived. Mohamed Desani reports from Mogadishu, Somalia. The Juba Airways plane was carrying civilian passengers from the southwestern city of Baidoa when it crashed at Mogadishu's Adanade International Airport on Monday. Ahmed Mualim, Somalia's civil aviation director, who is spoke to VOA by phone, said the plane crashed around 11 a.m. local time while landing at the airport. According to eyewitnesses at the airport, the plane descended too early before the runway, flipped upon the touch on the ground, and landed upside down. Witnesses told VOA that the plane caught on fire and saw firefighters battling to put out the flames. Despite the crash and the fire, Mualim says, all that six people on board survived the crash and that only three people sustained minor injuries. Authorities have not determined why the plane crashed. Mohamed Dyson for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. And in other news, former British Finance Minister Rishi Sunak won the most support in the third round of voting to find a replacement for Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Monday as lawmaker Tom Tungahat was eliminated. Sunak won the round with 115 votes. The former chancellor will be joined in the next round, which will be put on a vote on Tuesday by Penny Mordant, who won 82 votes, Liz Truss, who won 71 votes, and Kami Benuch, who secured 58 votes. For more on this story and other breaking news, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Remember to connect with us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Search for VOA Africa. You are listening to VOA's International Edition. I am Chinedu Afo in Washington. The aid group Refugees International has expressed concern about the reported relocation of more than 100 Eritrean refugees from areas near Addis Ababa to camps on the unstable border between Ethiopia's Amhara and Tigray regions. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's Africa News Center in Nairobi, Kenya. Ethiopian authorities are accused of targeting Eritrean refugees by arresting them in the capital and sending them back to the country's restive north. 
Abdullahi Halake is a refugee's international senior advocate for East and Southern Africa. Over the last few days, Eritrean refugees who have been living in Ethiopia for some time now, and so the government rounded up these refugees who are in this Ababa in several buses and took them back to the Amara region. And as you well know that the Amara region and the Tigray region, uh, they border each other and there is tension. Amhara and Tigrayan forces have been fighting over land and other long-standing disputes. About 20,000 Eritrean refugees lived in two refugee camps in the Tigray region before the war between Ethiopia's government and Tigrayan rebels broke out in November 2020. After Eritrean and Tigrayan forces allegedly attacked the camps, many of the refugees fled to the Amhara and Afar regions, with others moving to the capital Addis Ababa. In late 2020, Ethiopian authorities carried out a similar operation, targeting Eritrean refugees in the capital, sending them to Adi Harush and Mai Ani in the Tigray region at the height of the war. Halaka says in many ways, Eritrean refugees are the most vulnerable group in Ethiopia. They are caught between Eritrean government tracking them because uh, it paints a bad image about their country. And, you know, the warring parties inside Ethiopia also targeting them. As such, they are in probably the most difficult position. So death, sexual violence and so many other egregious human rights uh, and humanitarian violations have been visited upon them. Last year, Human Rights Watch said Eritrean forces and Tigray militias committed killings, rape and other abuses against Eritrean refugees. Ethiopia hosts at least 140,000 Eritreans who fled hardship and persecution in their home country. Refugees International, an organization which promotes human rights and the protection of refugees, is calling on Ethiopian authorities to respect its laws and protect Eritrean refugees from those who wish to harm them. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Thank you, Mohamed. And NASA says the images from the Webb Space Telescope are the deepest and most detailed ever taken on the universe. Using infrared technology, the telescope offers crystal clear views of things never seen before. With the ability to look back over 13 and a half billion years, Webb will help scientists study the formation of the universe's earliest galaxies, explain how our solar system developed, and answer whether there could be life on other planets. Bob Dempsey is a former NASA flight director for the International Space Station. He tells viewers Carol Van Dam that one of the most amazing images is Stefan's quintet. Basically what it is, is we're going to learn a lot about how our universe was formed and how planets like our own form and quite possibly how life like ours form. And that'll help us both in just the big picture of knowing where we fit in the universe and how it all came about, but also we'll learn science about particles, about planets that we'll be able to apply. You know, for example, as we learn things about planets, as we're experiencing climate change here on the Earth, we may be able to get some lessons learned from these other planets. When you said it's totally different than the Hubble in that, you know, it had to be right the first time, you mean because astronauts can't just go up there, nobody can go up there and fix or tinker with things, right? Correct. Hubble was designed from the beginning to be serviced by astronauts, and there was a couple reasons for that. One, when it was being designed in the uh, 70s, space technology was such that we knew that components could only last a limited amount of time. And we knew that Hubble was going to be there for a number of years, and you'd want to change them out. So it was designed from the beginning that astronauts would periodically go up and fix things and change out instruments. But Webb, so that it can do the most powerful science, needed to be way far away from the Earth. And we just don't have the technology to go out that far and repair it or change it. So it was designed from the beginning to work once out of the box. And why are scientists interested in infrared astronomy like we have here with the Webb Space Telescope? Well, infrared, it's part of the same spectrum that we see. You know, we have the optical spectrum that you and I see, red, orange, yellow, blue, green. And then if you go to what we call shorter wavelengths, you get ultraviolet and X-ray. And then to the longer wavelengths, you get the infrared and even radio. These different wavelengths go through the universe in different ways. And it turns out, like, for example, the ultraviolet and X-ray are very easily absorbed by other gases and dust that are out there. The infrared can go much further, so you can actually see galaxies farther away, which turns out to be further back in time. 
And so it's a part of the window that we can see that gives us a very different picture than we've been able to see with Hubble or other probes. That's astrophysicist Bob Dempsey, the former flight director of the International Suspicion, talking about the Webb Space Telescope images released last week by NASA. He was speaking with VOA's Carol Van Dam. Go beyond the daily headlines with VOA's Flashpoint Ukraine. Each weekday at 2105 UTC, join me, Steve Miller, as I put the latest developments into a global context with interviews and analysis. Listen online at voanews.com slash flashpoint or in your favorite podcast player. And to all our VOA listeners, please note we have moved our programs to a new website, voaafrica.com, from voanews.com. There you will find all your favorite VOA radio and television programs and a whole lot more. Find us on voaafrica.com. And thanks for listening. This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. On behalf of the entire production team, thank you so much for listening. Visit our website for in-depth coverage of world events and news 24 hours a day at voaafrica.com. Until next time, I am Chino Dofo in Washington, wishing you a great day. An editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. Developing countries often lack the essential infrastructure to help navigate global shocks, like the recent COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, they feel the impacts more acutely and have a harder time recovering, explained President Joe Biden at the recent G7 summit in Germany. To mitigate such impacts, the G7 is launching the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. The United States will mobilize $200 billion in public and private capital over the next five years to invest in health, digital connectivity, gender equality and equity, climate and energy security. Under the category of health, the United States, its G7 partners and the World Bank are investing in a new industrial-scale vaccine manufacturing facility in Senegal. When complete, it will have the potential to produce hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines annually. That's why the Digital Investment Program is mobilizing $335 million in investment capital for digital connectivity, infrastructure, and digital financial services that strengthen open, interoperable, reliable, inclusive, and secure digital ecosystems in emerging markets. The U.S. government also supported the bid by an American company, Subcom, for a $600 million contract to build a global subsea telecommunications cable. History has demonstrated that when women and girls are free to fully participate in society, there is a positive impact across their communities, said President Biden. The United States is committing $50 million over five years to the World Bank Global Child Care Incentive Fund. This public-private partnership, supported by several G7 partners, will help countries build infrastructure that makes it easier for women to participate equally in the labor force. In order to protect against climate change, it is vital to invest in clean energy projects. For example, the U.S. just facilitated a new partnership between two American firms and the government of Angola to invest $2 billion in building new solar projects in Angola. And in Romania, the American company New Scale Power will build a first-of-its-kind small modular reactor plant. This will help bring online zero-emission nuclear energy to Europe faster, more cheaply, and more efficiently. This isn't aid or charity, declared President Biden. It's an investment that will boost all of our economies, and it's a chance for us to share our positive vision for the future and let communities around the world see for themselves the concrete benefits of partnering with democracies. 
That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government.